A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, 14 members of a religious group have been arrested and charged with the murder of an eight-year-old girl. Police say the cult-like group allegedly denied the little girl insulin for her diabetes. She suffered for six days before dying, and her parents are part of the 14 arrested. They believed that medicine was bad and that prayers and songs would save the child. Let's just say the rest of us are praying that this child gets some justice. But first, a love triangle turns deadly. And you know what I always say, love triangles never end well. This triangle involves a yoga instructor and two professional cyclists. Police say that the two cyclists were having an affair. And when the yoga instructor found out that her boyfriend was spinning some other woman's wheels, she killed her. Now, the yoga teacher, according to authorities, fled the country, ran off to Central America, reportedly had plastic surgery to change her appearance, and then was just captured by U.S. Marshals, hiding in, of all places a yoga lodge, of course, because no one would think to look there. All right, we are recording this on Wednesday, July 13th, 2022. Our guest is Josh Ritter, former LA County prosecutor, uh, currently a criminal defense attorney, and not only a friend of the show and my friend, but also hosts a companion podcast here on the channel called Sidebar. Hey, Josh, how are you? Welcome back. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me back. I've been looking forward to this. I know it's kind of funny. It's like it's um, you got your own podcast, so you don't need to come on here anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But we're glad to have you. (laughs) I'm very excited about this. So these cases are obviously insane and extreme. Uh, The first case we're going to look at, I I really we're going to go into a lot of detail on this one, because, Josh, what I find interesting about this love triangle that went so terribly wrong is the layers of what happens in these interpersonal relationships and how people react to being scorned, to cheating, to jealousy. And this is like the worst possible scenario. Yeah. I mean, here you got a woman who otherwise living a crime free life who jumps straight to murder uh, because of, you know, this, like you said, this love triangle and emotions and how people react. Yeah. And and so I want to, you know, we're going to delve into a little bit of what, you know, police have uncovered and some of the, you know, the lies that were told, the confrontations and how this was all building up. You know, I don't think anyone expected this outcome. And I think when most people embark on these, you know, affairs and cheating and all this other stuff, that the last thing you expect is that someone's going to end up dead. But I always say, you know, people's feelings get so hurt. People get so upset. You don't know. You don't know what some people are capable of until they're pushed. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, It's tragic. And so let's get right to it here. So our first case is out of Texas, and this is where a a woman wanted for allegedly murdering her boyfriend's secret lover has been finally apprehended. She was arrested in Costa Rica after being on the run for two months. 34-year-old Caitlin Armstrong has been wanted in connection with a murder since May. Caitlin, who is a yoga instructor in Austin, Texas, is accused of killing her boyfriend's lover, 25-year-old professional cyclist, Anna Mariah Wilson, who goes by her middle name most of the time, Mariah or Mo. So so we'll stick to that. Now, Mariah was considered an amazing athlete. She was a skier, then a pro cyclist. Mariah apparently spent a lot of time on the road competing in a lot of these races, and she was competing with the yoga instructor's boyfriend. That's how they met. They were in this world professionally, and the boyfriend in this case or the man in the middle of the love triangle really is 35 year old colin strickland now colin and caitlin that would be the yoga instructor (laughs) and the pro cyclist they live together and they'd been dating for about three years and during a short period of time the couple broke up this is how it is explained and in that time frame which I always say is always so convenient. Um, He had an affair with Mariah. 
So there are numerous versions, Josh, in the court record of how long the affair lasted. Was it on again, off again? Was it really off? There are various versions of this depending on who you are believing. You don't want to leave it all at this this man's feet. Like you said, people don't know how others are going to react. But as we're going to find out the the kind of uh, deception that he's pulling with the changing of the names and the phone and deleting text messages, whether or not it was like an affair affair, he certainly knows that his current girlfriend would not be happy if he found out even about the communications with her. So it's it already it's getting a little uh, little dicey on his part. Absolutely. That's just it, because, you know, we don't know what the state of the relationship was at the end. He has said very strongly and the victim, Mariah's family and friends have said very strongly after all this happened, saying, look, these two were not in a romantic relationship at the time of the murder. Yes, they were friends. They had found a way that their relationship was, um, you know, platonic. Uh, It's very important to both sides and all these families that, that everyone understands that, that they had reached this place. But, you know, the thing is, if the accused killer isn't so sure that that's the case, that creates a problem. And then the other thing is, if it is a platonic relationship, why is it on the day of the murder that Colin is sending text messages to his girlfriend saying that he's dropping off flowers at a friend's house somewhere else when he's actually going for a swim and going out to dinner with his friend, Mariah? Like, why? Does he know that his girlfriend gets upset about this? Does he, I mean, what what do you do in a situation like this? Yeah, and it's just adding fuel to the fire with her. She's already sounds like she's the jealous type. And now maybe she's uncovering some of these deceptions and knows that he's lying to her. And you can see where her head just starts to kind of spin out of control. Again, not trying to lay it at his feet, but it's dicey when you're hiding things, even if everything's quote unquote platonic, which I don't really think it was. Uh, it's it's dicey when you start hiding things and deceptions and lying and everything else. Yeah, it definitely adds to, you know, you could really you could really see the build up here. You could yeah. really see the build up. So the one thing that police say that they are absolutely certain about is that on the night that Mariah was murdered, she had gone for a swim and dinner with Colin. They're certain of this uh, based on not only security cameras and surveillance cameras, Colin's version of events, friends version. You know, that's the one thing we seem to all know is, is true, that that's what happened. That at least is clear. But you can see the fact that the two of them are going for a swim and then dinner. Mm -mm. (laughs) And if, um, yeah. If Caitlin's Uh upset, exactly. All right, so here's what happened on the night of the murder. He picked her up on um, his motorcycle, meaning Colin picked up Mariah, and then he dropped her off at a home that she was staying. A few minutes later, after Mariah's dropped off at this house, she's killed. And the only thing stolen from the house is her very expensive professional bike, which is found trashed near the house. Personal, isn't it? Yeah, very. I I didn't even think about it that way, but that's absolutely true. This is like this is the most important thing to you. Well, you've taken the most important thing to me from me and I'm just going to trash it after I've murdered you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So police say that the motive is quite simple. They say that Caitlin Armstrong was jealous of the other woman and Mariah Wilson was found dead, shot multiple times. Now, police say that Caitlin had even warned Mariah to stay away from her boyfriend. Uh, Apparently when it was revealed that in that time that they broke up, this happened. um, And then I guess there were more communications. Caitlin made it absolutely clear, leave my boyfriend alone. Interesting. Okay, that's according to police. Now, um, before we get into the details of the actual murder, I wanna talk about the history of these three people because I think it's only within the context of this relationship and what what those three in the relationship believed was going on with the other that we can have a greater understanding of the boiling point that was reached if indeed Caitlin is the killer. Remember, she's charged, presumed innocent, 
and we don't know the forensics and all that stuff that's not in yet or at least it hasn't been revealed correct so we are you know we don't know but she is suspect number one according to the police okay so caitlin and colin the yoga teacher and the cyclist, they began dating back in 2019. And then um, last year in October of 2021, uh, 2021, the two break up for like two weeks or something. And that's when Colin and Mariah, the fellow cyclists, begin a brief affair, which supposedly ended. And then Colin went back to Caitlin. Okay. But Colin apparently continued to communicate with Mariah, who, remember, he is um, their professional colleagues as well. So the question is, was it ever really over? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Okay. So as you mentioned, Josh, Colin had Mariah's phone number in his phone under a different name. Oh, my goodness. How many times have we seen this play, right? (laughs) Yeah. Why is Blockbuster Video texting you all these times? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What is it with this pizza place? Who's at the pizza place so obsessed exactly. with you? Right? So there's right. that because apparently what happened is, according, this is all based on, on court records, that when Caitlin found out about Mariah, that she went into her boyfriend's phone, into Colin's phone, deleted deleted her contact and then blocked her so that Mariah could not contact her boyfriend. Okay. So that's how actively Caitlin was in this man's phone. I'm blocking the girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, whatever. She can't call you. I don't want you to have her number. Anyway, he ultimately finds, finds a way to put her in the contacts of his phone under some other name. Interesting, right? Yeah. You know, I was thinking as you're talking, I'm thinking about this. It's almost like one of those things where you work in an office, uh, you and your girlfriend have a break, you have an affair with your coworker, and then, oh, you end things, but you see them every day, right? And you can imagine the rising level of jealousy because this was like his work, right? He's a cyclist. So he mm-hmm. sees her cycling and they're they're working out together and going for swims. It's like he's, you know, this is his 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 work wife that he's like hanging yeah. out with that he's supposed to be platonic with. You can. Yeah. The the the, the recipe for disaster uh, is pretty high here. As I always say, love triangles and never end well. They just yeah. never do. OK, so here's the other thing. This to me tells me so much about Caitlin. And I think so many people will like be able to understand this. So Caitlin decides that because Colin shares the love of writing with Mariah, the, the, you know, lover, ex-lover, the yoga teacher decides she's going to start writing and that she's going to start writing with Colin as a way of bonding and filling in that gap. Right. Sure. Well, it totally blows back. It's a disaster because he's a professional. She's not. She can't keep up with him. He's complaining. He's complaining that she is slowing him down. So if anything, it is creating like a bigger problem for them because she's inserting herself into his life with the hopes of rekindling and keeping her relationship straight. But it's backfiring because he's resenting her. Can you not see this in every like, you know, dramatic comedy involving yeah. affairs yeah and she's becoming more and more obsessed over him and over saving their relationship and over replacing uh whatever she believes mariah is in his life and yeah it's just it's continuing to escalate and you can see where it's going to reach that boiling point that you talk about yeah and i'm honestly there is a part of me that does feel badly here you know because it's yeah. like uh, you know what that feeling is like when you feel like you're losing someone and you're trying to like get their attention and 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 be what it is that you think they want you to be. You yeah. know, I I don't know, and, I, I can't say, but it's it's making me think that. And she's got blinders on too. She's not even she's not even thinking. Is this even a healthy relationship for me to be involved in? It's now it's just at the point of winning and being the one that he wants rather than her. Yes, it takes a turn. At one point, you're like, you go from like sympathy. It's like, oh, that's really sad. That's a tough place to be like, oh, okay, wait a minute. This is becoming obsessive. Somewhere a turn was made. So, okay, so this is not working. 
So something must have incited this most recent incident. And I think we can see the beginnings of it here in January of this year. Again, all of this based on police records that have been released as part of the arrest warrant. So in January of this year, police say that the affair was back on. That's what they say. I don't know. Police claim to have found text messages between the lovers suggesting that something was indeed going on and that Mariah, this is what undid everybody, I think, Mariah ran in to Colin and Caitlin, okay? So the girlfriend, the lover, runs into the couple. Now, the couple, they live in Texas. Mariah lives up in San Francisco. So they must have she, run into each other at an yeah. event. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm going to read to you the text that was released by the police. And this is a text message from Mariah, the lover, to Colin. Okay, because I, I know with so many people in a triangle, I'm trying to keep everyone uh, uh, um, following along. Quote, right. this weekend was strange for me and I just want to know what's going on. If you just want to be friends, read between the lines here. And then in parenthesis, she writes, seems to be the case, then that's cool. But I'd like to talk about it because honestly, my mind has been going in circles and I don't know what to think, close quote. Hmm. What does that mean, people? You're all going to weigh in, I know, on yeah. YouTube. But what is that an indication of? You, you know, it's funny and I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. But I, when I read that, I thought it. It, she sounds like she's being sincere. It didn't yes. seem manipulative to me. No, like if, no. if she were trying to really kind of turn the screws on him and be like, well, you need to make a choice. But it sounds like she's like, listen, this is confusing. You obviously got a lot going on. I don't want to be caught up in it. If you want to be friends, that's fine with me. I feel bad for, for Mariah here because it sounds like she was an honest broker in this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah especially if their affair actually started when he was available, you know? Right, right. And then then you have the entanglement of growing feelings and complications, and I get that. But yes, absolutely. I think what this text message means from Mariah to Colin is like, hey, what's going on? It's totally right. cool. You want to be friends? I'm fine with that, but could you just let me know? I just need to know what we are. And right. that's what I think this text message is asking him, which means something's going on here with, you know, and the police are more blunt about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I wonder what he's telling her this whole time. Mariah, I mean, is he telling her, oh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm breaking up with her or think she's awful to me. I can't get out of the relationship or so, you, you know, who knows how he's kind of stringing Mariah along again. We don't know. We'll we find don't know. Out. We, there's but been it, nothing of that, you know, revealed curious, yet. Right. Yes, it is very curious. So according to an unnamed witness who reached out to the police right after the murder, I'm, I know this is a, uh, a little bit history wise, if I'm not doing it exactly chronologically, it's for context here. So police say, according to this unnamed witness, that Caitlin Armstrong, the yoga teacher, was furious. She was furious at this point. She was so angry that the person says her body was shaking violently. You know, when you have a physical reaction to something, yeah. that's how she took this message. And that she allegedly said that she wanted to kill Mariah. Now, this is where I asked former prosecutor defense attorney, can that be used because... I always get confused when everyone screams in the courtroom, hearsay, hearsay. What yeah. the heck? I mean, does that, is this admissible well, it or is, not? It, it is hearsay, but it's a statement against her interests, right? So that would be an exception for where, why they would be able to bring it in. And it's also uh, me maybe being brought in for her state of mind and not so much to say that she, the, the truth of what she's saying, but just to show that she was in this incredibly angry state of mind. I, I think they absolutely get that statement in. Now, it's it's interesting that it's coming anonymously. So that's going to be a hurdle they're going to have to get around because they're going to have to have that person testify or at least some way of laying the foundation for that statement. But I I, I, I think I see in the future that if this goes to trial, that statement's getting in. Interesting. And does this show premeditation? Hard to argue it doesn't. Right. I mean, she's mm -hmm. she's 
obviously in kind of the the fit of rage and anger. So if you're the defense, you're going to say, no, 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 this is this is just in the spur of the moment. But if this is days in advance and she's this kind of angry, absolutely. That's that's thinking about killing someone. Right. And at this point, we're like months in advance. Um, yeah. This is, you know, the stuff starting to boil up. Now, let's get to May and what happened that further upsets Caitlin. So Anna Mariah Wilson arrives in town. Just her mere presence is probably <laughs> enough to upset Caitlin. So she's in Austin for a race and Caitlin and Colin are going to be in that race. And again, just remember that the yoga teacher and Colin live in Austin. Uh, Mariah lives in San Francisco, but Mariah's arrived in town for the race. So my right. guess is, here we go again. So according to Mariah's family and friends, they want to make it clear that at this point, Mariah and Colin are just friends. At this point of this stage of their relationship, on the you know at the time of the race so that's important for everyone to know perhaps you know from the text message that i read in the next few months they figured it out so according to the police report surveillance cameras witness statements here's what happened on the day of the murder colin strickland pulls up to the house where mariah is staying and he arrives at 5 45 he's on a motorcycle and about 5 55 the two take off now we know this because the owner of the house has a smart lock on the front door. This smart lock indicates to her and sends uh, text messages and alerts, plus registers it, who enters, opens and unlocks it based on the code. And Mariah has been given her own special code. So only Mariah apparently knows this code. And so this is helping to give us a timestamp of the movement in and out of the house which I think is very important for this timeline. So here's what we also know. Colin and Mariah went swimming. They went to a pool in Austin. Then according to police, he was texting his girlfriend, Caitlin, text messages suggesting he was somewhere else. Yeah. Probably not good. Yeah. Probably not a good idea. Police say he was trying to cover up that he was with Mariah. The two go to dinner after a swim to some burger place and at 8.36 p.m., the smart lock records Mariah is back home and surveillance cameras see that Colin drives away. So here we go. The surveillance cameras indicate he drops her off and he leaves. He doesn't spend the night. Right. So maybe these are all um, this is supporting evidence that they are platonic. OK, well, platonic ish, right? <laughs> well, you're you're playing with fire at this point, because right. because if you're lying to your girlfriend as to where you are and you are with a woman who you previously had an affair with, none of this sounds or looks good. Right. 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 <laughs> so, none of this is helpful here. OK, let's get back to the timeline. So. According to police records, Colin sends a text message to his girlfriend, the yoga instructor, about the same time that the door is being unlocked. So, you know, the, the times are lining up. Um, Mariah is getting in the house. He's sending a text message. I'm going to quote here from police records. Hey, are you out? Question mark. I went to drop some flowers for Allison at her son's house up north, and my phone died. Oh. Heading home, unless you have another food suggestion. So, so casual, so, so matter of fact. <laughs> A complete lie, people. Yeah. A complete lie as to where he was. What I love that. I love. I love the detail about I. My phone died. Kind of deal to explain the why she was calling him thirty two times in a row and he wasn't answering. Right. My phone died. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Back to the timeline, everyone. So one minute later at eight thirty seven p.m. Remember, Mariah unlocks the door. Eight thirty six. One minute later, what do surveillance cameras pick up? They pick up a vehicle, a jeep. That looks just like the car vehicle that who drives Caitlin. Right. <laughs> okay. So they, they now see this 
Colin at this point is home by 8:43. So when this car is being picked up on the other side of town, he's back home. Caitlin arrives back now. Caitlin and Colin live together. So she arrives back home at 9:23. So we know when she got home and he's there waiting for her. I wonder, we have not heard any of this, but I'd love to know the details of what happened when she came back, right. who picked up on what. I, I just, I don't know. I'd love to be a fly on that wall. So back right. to the murder scene. I know we took a little detour there, but I want you to know that things are happening at the same time. So back at the murder scene, the homeowner returns to where Mariah is staying, and she sees that the door is open. It is unlocked. Nothing appears to be missing except for Mariah's um, special racing bicycle, which you know, police found from the house about 60, 60 feet away. So it was didn't go far when it got pulled out and trashed. Mariah is bleeding on the bathroom floor. The homeowner calls 911, does CPR. But by 1010, Mariah has passed. Yeah. She's dead. So a lot of really interesting things here, right? First of all, if Caitlin is proved to be involved in this, how did she know where Mariah was staying? Right. Either she's been following everybody or she's got some sort of tracking device on his phone. Who knows? Also, there's no forced entry. Right. So right. so Mariah must have let her in at some point to maybe have a chat and figure this all out. And the fact that the, her body is found inside in the bathroom makes me believe that it wasn't a confrontation that took place at the at the doorway. Right. So there's just a lot of interesting kind of uh, clues and then missing pieces that I'm, I'm, I'm curious to find out about later. Yeah. A lot of this we don't have yet. We don't. That's where all the details will be. It's the whole. And my feeling is, you know, if if that Jeep arrives because police have not said anything about um, the detail of whether or not uh, Caitlin has been picked up on any of these surveillance cameras. So again, we have to keep it to what we know and what police are saying, which is the vehicle. If that vehicle arrives one minute after they depart, I find that hard to believe that that's coincidence. She's right. either sitting there waiting or she's tracking them. There's no yeah. other, you know, there's no other way. The timing You're of it is- You're completely right. Yeah. I mean, it's just- and we and it would be interesting to know geographically where this house is compared to where their home is, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're you're right. She must have either been sitting there waiting for them to come back, um, or had been following them the whole time. Yeah, very interesting. And that and if she was either way, if she's sitting there or she's following them, none of this is helping her emotional state, right? Right. Because none of this information is positive. <laughs> none and, of and and keep in mind she's probably got a, a gun in the car with her yeah. we're assuming well we do know that mariah was shot multiple right. times we know that so that's as far as police have gone on that and then they'll you know we'll fill in the pieces where some guns were retrieved through a search warrant at the home that uh, caitlin and colin share so as far as the ballistics of all of that and the murder weapon we do not know yet if police actually have recovered the murder weapon. We're still right. waiting on that information. So the following day, police go to interview Colin Strickland. Now, this to me, these are these little moments in life that I find so interesting in an investigation. And police even say in their own records that as they're pulling up to the house to interview Colin, they recognize one of the vehicles in the driveway matching a vehicle that they saw outside. So already they're they're going ding, 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 ding. Right. And they've probably at this point been filled in a little bit about what's been going on. But I think that moment also solidifies a lot for you about where you're going to go with this investigation. So officers um, execute the search warrant at the couple's house and they find two guns. One belongs to Colin, one belongs to Caitlin. They were purchased, police say, around the time of that really awkward run in with the three of them in January. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So December, January is where they're saying that the that the guns were purchased. But again, it could have been Christmas gifts. I mean, it's it's we don't know yet. We right. just we don't know. But the timing is interesting. So then now this is the part that's fascinating. So now we've 
Police have heard Colin's version of events and then police pick up Caitlin Armstrong. But instead of just asking her to come in for questioning, they actually apprehend her and take her into custody because they say she has an outstanding search warrant, excuse me, an outstanding arrest warrant, which ends up not being valid. So they right. have to release her. What is yeah. that about? I don't know. But that was the most frustrating part of the story to me. And it's, it, you, it can easily be, easily be lost if you're just reading the news about this because they kind of just skip skip over it. And, you know, in the course of their interview, they found out that the warrant wasn't valid and she was free to go. They must have known they had her right sitting right there. I mean, I know that they don't have all the evidence, but they, there's a lot pointing to her already at this point. And the fact that they've got this defective warrant, it is just so frustrating from a law enforcement point of view that you don't got all your T's crossed and I's dotted, that you have the person that you probably could have held on this other warrant, right? They keep on talking about it being unrelated, but if it's a felony warrant, it's enough to hold a person for at least 48 hours. In that time, they probably put could have put together enough for an arrest warrant on the homicide because I think they come out with her arrest warrants a few days later. So it's just frustrating. This could have been somebody who just disappeared for forever. We're gonna find out that wasn't the case, but the fact that you had this person in custody and then had to let them go over a technicality is very frustrating. But Josh, here's the thing though. They have her in and they're questioning her. And according to the the write-ups, you know, the synopsis of those conversations that are included in the court record, we don't have it all, that, you know, when they asked her, could you please explain to us why your Jeep was at the scene of the murder? She didn't answer. And right. when she was asked, this is again, according to records, that was she angry at Mariah and what was going on? She didn't say a word. So whether they had that warrant or not, it didn't seem like Caitlin was going to be cooperative. So right. at that point, warrant aside, could they have really held her any longer this is so early in the investigation it's like right. the next day or two right they don't they don't have enough if all if if all we know that they knew at that time is is what you just said then no that's not enough the fact that her car very suspicious the fact you or or a car matching the description of her car the fact that she doesn't really have a good explanation the fact that she has a motive all of it's you know raising that specter of suspicion but not enough for an arrest warrant but my other question is, if you believe this to be the person, you can't put a tail on her. You can't put eyes on her for a couple of days while you work this case up to get together the evidence. I mean, maybe they didn't feel she was a flight risk. Right. Uh, we're going to find out that she was they're going to be proved very wrong. <laughs> well, it, well, police can't, especially if you're not charged. I don't know. You explain this to me. Can police just say to her, give me your passport? Isn't that something no. that a judge has to decide? Absolutely. Yeah. No, they right. have no they, they this unrelated warrant gives them no legal authority to seize anything from her related to their investigation of the murder to even the questioning of her. She could have stopped. She could have said, I want a lawyer. I, I don't know what I'm doing sitting here. Instead, so, she said she wanted to leave. Get me out yeah, of here. Yeah. So I, I don't think that they had enough at this point. And, you know, we'll still find out whether once the forensics and all the other evidence is in, we'll we'll see how much more police have. But I could, you know. You don't know who's going to be a flight risk or not, True. right? I, True. I I don't know who's going to take off. Um, most don't, right? Most people don't yeah, take I, off. I, I, that's probably a fair assessment to say that most people are not hopping on a plane to Mexico, put it that way. But at the same time, you have this brutal murder and there's apparently an outstanding person who's armed and dangerous. And if you believe this might be the person, I don't know how many how much resources it takes to just make sure a patrol vehicle sitting on that that house. Well, maybe they figured because she was a yoga teacher, she could like do some deep breathing exercises <laughs> and, con and control herself. <laughs> I don't know. Let's get back to the events here. So a day after being questioned, which would have been May 13th, that's about two days, few days after the murder, Caitlin Armstrong um, but this is the day after being questioned, sells her Jeep Grand Cherokee to an Austin CarMax dealership for a little over $12,000. I find that interesting because what does that mean about potential forensics? I guess, you know, there's certain things that always remain in the car, but now the car is somewhere else, belongs to someone else, complicating things. But the bottom line is there's cash. So maybe this is your getaway money. Yeah. Which is what I think it turns out to be is more about getaway money than anything else. May 14th, the day after she sells the car, 
According to U.S. Marshals and Austin Police, she boards a plane to New York. Inside Edition has reported that Caitlin was in New York for a few days, maybe, they're speculating, maybe with her sister oh, who lives there. Okay. That's their reporting. Caitlin is then spotted a few days later back at an airport, but a different airport. Now she's at Newark Airport on May 18th. So what's interesting is they have surveillance pictures of Caitlin. And my favorite part of this is she's got her yoga mat rolled up under her backpack that she's carrying. So yeah, you want to blend in? You're that person on the airplane with the yoga mat. Even, even as a fugitive, she's not going to give up the, the daily routine. <laughs> no, right. but it's like you, everyone always knows that one person who shows up on the plane with the yoga mat. Hey, I do yoga. It's to, I mean, but I... Do you know what I'm saying? There are certain things. It's like the person who arrives with the giant fishing equipment (laughs) and the fishing vest. There's always, they're they're the characters on an airplane that you remember. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So she's that person. Right. Okay. She boards a plane, but here's what authorities are telling us. They know, they say they can put her at the airport, but they didn't know where she was going. That's what they claim because she didn't use her passport. So she gets out of the country. Um, Apparently, Apparently, they believe at this point that she has fled to Costa Rica. This point, now there's an arrest for her warrant. And so she's a wanted person and the U.S. Marshals are on it. But it's going to be like 40 days before anybody ever finds Caitlin. We don't know when they got on her, you know, on her scent, her track. But it was 40 days before she was apprehended. In that time frame, this to me is fascinating. In that time frame, she has darkened her hair. She has made it shorter, but really it's the same style. And I would argue to you people, okay, if you really want to disguise yourself, wouldn't you go, why would you just shorten it but keep the same shape? I know I'm sounding like a girl here, but it's like, (laughs) if you're going to disguise yourself, people. Yeah, why are we tiptoeing? Jump all in. Yes, jump all in. Totally, right? (laughs) So you are not at all recognizable. Okay. This is also interesting. Both Inside Edition and the New York Post report that she may have gotten a nose job while she was on the run in Costa Rica, that she had plastic surgery. Now, the authorities claim that they found like a $6,000 bill receipt for in, in her locker among her possessions for this nose job, this this surgery. It's a different name, so we don't know whether, you know, that was hers or not, but it kind of makes sense. Now, yeah. again, people, if I'm going to change my appearance here as to not be recognized, I don't know. Would the nose job be enough? I, I, right. But it's, but if she did get the nose job, she, Josh, she spent half her money on that thing. I know. But by the way, $6,000, that's like, what a bargain. (laughs) I mean, this this whole thing fascinates me because, you know, we all play that game. Like, how would you get away? Like, what would you do? And she takes a lot of pretty incredible steps. I mean, first of all, the fact that she's like not flying directly to where she's escaping to that, you know, she's going through New York and then through New Jersey and then back to Costa Rica. She's got a different name when she does it. She changes her look. She's not going to a very pop. I mean, a lot of this, it's the story is incredible to me for two reasons. And they're complete opposites. One, that they were able to find her after even 40 days. That's pretty incredible police work. And then two, that she was gone for 40 days and didn't disappear forever. You know what I mean? It's like you figure you're gone that long, change the way you look. You have just become a different person in a different country and they're never going to find you. But the incredible place work that they were able to track her down. Well, I'm going to say she left some pretty big <laughs> clues. Police would have to be blind, these marshals. And I love the U.S. marshals. But I got to say she left massive breadcrumbs <laughs> along the way. I'm going to argue with you, Josh. Yeah. First of all, where do they find her? Staying at a youth hostel which is also a yoga lodge. Yeah, it's okay? incredible. Please, people. I mean, really, a, a, where else would they be looking for her? She's carrying her yoga mat. <laughs> she's at a yoga lodge, and she's at a beach resort with tourists. Come on now. 
We're looking for a yoga instructor. Where do we look first? <laughs> so I'm just saying, I know what you're, that's like incredible police work, but yeah. come on now. She yeah. helped you out even on the surveillance with her giant yoga mat rolled up behind her. She made it very easy for all of you to, I mean, come on now. Can you imagine come on. Her, her packing her bags and she's figuring she's going to escape to another country for maybe the rest of her life. She's grabbing socks and shoes and everything else, but says, I got to bring the mo yoga mat too. <laughs> like that's mm -hmm. that's not something you could leave behind and, and get another time or maybe put that part of your life behind while you right. while you you're an escape fugitive for murder. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, the U.S. Marshals, I've spent a lot of time with them and, and done surveillance with them. I'm huge fans of the U.S. Marshals. And they always say this to me. It's like. People are extremely predictable. Yeah. We always get people going back to familiar places. Right. They're always a, a familiar link. And, and, and she's made it very possible. She's made it absolutely possible for them, you know, to find her. Yeah. Okay. I'd be the so, guy who was caught uh, at the bar watching a Dodger game. That's how they would figure me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that now. <laughs> That good information. We'll store that one. Okay, so let let's get back here. So obviously, Caitlin's um, you know is using a fake name according to the marshals. She was captured on June 29th at a hostel um, on Santa Teresa Beach. Caitlin Marie Armstrong was extradited back to the U.S. and she is now being held in a Travis County jail. She's been in there since July 6. Caitlin Armstrong faces murder charges. In addition, she's facing charges for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And that part of it will be handled in a federal court, which is always interesting to me because sometimes, you know, if you, you can't get a person on one thing, sometimes you get them on something else. We'll, we'll see. We don't, we don't know how this is going to play out. Now, I want to get back to Colin for a moment here because I think this is very important. We've talked about consequences for actions here. Colin Strickland released a statement to the Austin American Statesman newspaper saying that his relationship with Mariah was platonic and strictly professional in the end. <clears throat> as I've said, this is very important to both sides of the family here. And this is his quote. He says, there is no way to adequately express the regret and torture I feel about my proximity to this horrible crime. I am sorry and I simply cannot make sense of this unfathomable situation. Yeah, well, you know, it, there's a little sense to be made in the fact that you're 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 lying to your girlfriend and kind of running around with a woman that, you know, she's obviously obsessed with. I mean, she practically changed her entire lifestyle to try to replace this person in your life. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to say all of this falls at his feet, but it, it, it's just so sad that um, things like this get escalated out of hand. I mean, obviously, the, the person responsible here is whoever shot Mariah. Right. And it, absolutely. Regardless of the fooling around and whether it was platonic or not, maybe it was completely platonic at that point. But it, it, the person responsible is whoever pulled the trigger. But it, it's just sad that. Um, they, these, these folks couldn't figure it out so that it, it didn't end this way. Yes. Yes. Because if the person charged is the person who did it, according to police, all these other actions and words and lies may have contributed to this situation. Yeah. The whole thing is tragic. I can't wait to hear all of you weigh in on what you think of, of this. It's, it's just such a tragic and complicated case. Yeah. Our next case represents horrible child abuse that led to the death of an eight-year-old girl. The girl had diabetes and her parents withheld insulin, according to police, because police say that her parents belong to a fringe religious group that some are calling a cult. And this group didn't believe in medicine. Now, this case is out of Australia. And I believe that it's a very significant legal case because Prosecutors here have not only charged the parents with murder, but they've charged 12 additional members of this religious group with the murder of this little girl. Now, this group, they say that they were singing and praying for her health to be restored. But the one thing they didn't do is get her any medical care. 
And and we're talking about the death here of eight-year-old Elizabeth Strews. And and the reason I want to talk about this, Josh, not only is this a horrific crime, but I believe that it is so appropriate that prosecutors in Australia are being so aggressive because generally what we see here in the States oftentimes is we'll hear prosecutors and police say, well, you know, if they even charge the parents, right, they'll charge the parents. And then if there was anyone else in any way associated, they'll say, well, you know, there's just not enough evidence and really the rule of law, la, 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 and whatever. But in this case, prosecutors have said, and they took the time, they took six months to arrest the next 12 people. Prosecutors have said, these adults stood by and watched this child die an agonizing, horrific, painful death for six days and did nothing to help this child. And therefore, they are all complicit in her death and we're going after them. And I am just... I just think it's, I can't say the word precedent setting in the traditional sense, but I just, I applaud them for being so aggressive in this case. Yeah. Yeah. It really, it is remarkable. I, I, it can't kind of be understated. Uh, I I have not heard of something like that. Uh, I, I mean, the only thing that I can think of that even comes kind of close that we've seen here in the States recently is with the the other officers who were charged in the murder of George Floyd, how they were charged for not taking an action. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about being charged for an action that you took. That's usually what we see in a criminal case, right? You you took a criminal action and we're going to hold you responsible for it. Now we're saying you didn't take an action and you should be held responsible for that. And I think the reason why this case turned the corner for prosecutors. And I'm, I'm going to be interested to see what their arguments actually end up being. But what you pointed out at the very beginning is that they withheld insulin. To me, from what I've read, that means they they already knew she had this condition. They already were giving her medication for this condition. And then for whatever reason, call it religion or what have you, they decided to no longer give that to her, meaning that the parents and everybody else involved knew that there was a step they could take to save this young girl's life. And they didn't take that step. It's not like she got sick out of nowhere and they had no idea what to do. So they all decided to pray over her. They knew what they could have done to save this poor girl's life. And they didn't take that step. And therefore, the prosecution in this case is holding them all responsible for that mental state, that mens rea of murder. What a completely avoidable death. Yeah. So many people live with diabetes and it can be treated. And and I'll even maybe give them the benefit of the doubt and say, what if they didn't know she had diabetes? What if what if this was perhaps a recent development, her illness? The fact that over the course of six days, she is getting progressively worse. Right. And you're instead of, you know, picking up the phone or taking her to the hospital, you're praying and singing louder than ever. Give me a freaking break. Yeah. Uh, again, deliberate decisions to not seek medical care, deliberate, conscious decisions not to help a child dying a torturous death. Yeah, I I just, you know, it's, it's amazing. It, it, it is. It's incredibly heartbreaking because, as you point out, this was not. <sighs> This was not an easy death. This was not a quick death. This was a, a a slow and miserable death for this young girl. And that's awful. And that's part of the reason I imagine the prosecutors are being this strong about it. But it, from a legal perspective, it really starts to push the envelope on when you, can you just say I'm an innocent bystander? I'm, mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't do any of this. I, I wasn't the one who had, knew where the insulin was in her house. I was just standing there and I'm part of this congregation. And I was just praying and singing like everyone else. And these prosecutors are saying that's not enough. And that's a really just from a legal perspective, interesting uh, case to keep in mind. Yeah. And and I also appreciate the fact that by being this aggressive, that what the authorities in Australia are doing are, are really broadening the powers that they have to further protect children. And I, I, I so appreciate that, that they're thinking 
out of the box instead of the, oh, uh, you know what, there's no law that says that we can. No, they're just going for it. They're not going for it without, obviously, a, a thorough investigation and reasons um, for them to get. They got arrest warrants. It's not like they just like, you know, they right. they just did this. They, they took six months, six months to build a case on the other 12. So um, it took a long time to gather the evidence. So a little bit more details here on um, this religious group and on Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Now, the New York Times reports that this cult doesn't have a name, but news organizations in Australia have done a lot of digging and, and they disagree. And so I wanted to present both because, you know, these are all different news organizations and I, I want to present as much information as I can. And, and you know, until more comes out, this is what we do know. So Australian news organizations say the group is called The Saints. And they don't believe in medicine and they don't believe in medical care. And it's a small group that's made up of three families that do this communal worship out of their homes in Queensland. The group formed after, I guess as a breakaway group of another church that for some reason this group thought was corrupt. Really, you know what, in this case, given the outcome, I'm gonna take corrupt over you know, this, this moral bankruptcy of, of not helping a child in need. So, um, as the years went by, this is according to Australian news reports, the group's belief became more strict. And I think we see that as groups become insular, they get harsher, stricter, you know, Usually yeah. not a positive thing. Right. So reportedly, sources told news outlets that the Saints was a very tight-knit religious group with no known ties to any other church, according to the victim's sister. Now, so the whole Elizabeth's whole family was in this group. One of the sisters left. Jade Strews said that the religious group did not celebrate Christmas Again, no medical intervention, and they believe that the members' roles were to purely just serve God. My guess is God would really, really want Elizabeth alive. Yeah. So according to authorities, Elizabeth's parents, Elizabeth's parents, brothers and sisters were all members, um, and police are alleging that, that, that all the members who were there when Elizabeth was dying, that they all refused to help her. So Elizabeth passed on January 7th in her family's home in Toowoomba. Paramedics were not called until the next day. Josh, do you know what they were doing according to police? Please tell me. They were praying and singing for her resurrection. Yeah. You know... <laughs> There's another really kind of interesting wrinkle in this whole thing. And I, I was thinking of it as you were kind of describing the the, the religious aspect of all of this. Um, first of all, this is in Australia. So they don't have the First Amendment. They don't have the same kind of religious protections that we do here. Wait, so I think, but Australia, you know, is a democracy and, and has and does I, honor religious freedoms. And I, I'm sure that they do. I'm just saying I can't apply our constitutional oh, oh, I see what law you're saying. to what they're doing there. Yes, yes. Right? OK, I, I'm I, sorry. OK. I, right. I can I can only handle one constitution at a time. <laughs> OK. Uh, but but what but I, what I am saying is that there is this, it, it, again, legal question that's kind of interesting in that this wasn't a death by abuse, right? In the traditional sense of that they- It is abuse. Like oh, I'm gonna argue it, with yes, it is absolutely abuse. It's like I, when I you deny, saying. right? When you deny right. a child water and food, like we've seen right. children held in cages and, and they find them emaciated 40 pounds lighter than they should be. Right. That in the United States is technically abuse. Absolutely, but I, I guess what I'm saying is it, it, they weren't flogging her, they weren't, uh, you know, trying to get the devil out of her by nearly drowning her or something. We hear these kind of horrific stories with these religious cults doing these types of things. This was this was a, a religious belief that they didn't take magic medications. We have some religions in this country that, that have True. similar views, right? Yes, and it's gone to the courts, right? Correct, where, correct. Where, where teenagers need life-saving infusions or cancer treatments. Or, or cancer, like you said, cancer treat, treatments or, or, yes, or surgeries yes. or something. Blood transfusions. Right, and so at what point 
And again, I, I don't know in Australia, but I know in, in the States, it becomes a very difficult question of, are you practicing your religion? Or as you say, is this just child abuse? And we can say that's a crime. And so it's an interesting wrinkle. Again, I think the biggest thing here that stood out to me was the withdrawing of the medication. To me, that maybe I'm wrong in the way I was reading the articles, but that, to me, that means they were giving her this medication. They were helping her with this disease and then for whatever reason, decided to cut it off. And that is a huge distinction to me. But we'll we'll see how this all plays out. We'll see how it plays out under the, the Australian Constitution. But I was just thinking about it from uh, from the pr perspective here of the U.S. First Amendment. What, what kind of questions could this raise? Always really complicated when, yeah. you know, police and prosecutors are faced with um, religious freedom and any issues. So many times police don't act because they feel that they can't get involved because it's a very gray area because of religious freedom and rights. And I am the other thing is, you know, I feel like there's a bit of a double standard sometimes where there are, um, if you're a little bit more recognized, a little bit maybe more um, organized religion, and you have some views that could be considered as, you know, perhaps ultimately harmful to a child that may need medical attention, but then you have a more fringe organization, right. it's like, all of a sudden it becomes a judgment call. Yeah. Whose religion, <laughs> whose who, religion who, is more valid? Yeah. Is, is this really a religion or are you guys just simply a brainwashed cult? And yeah, no, it's, it's, again, there's, there's no real clear lines in any of this. Oh, it's very, very layered and really complicated, which again, I know you all are going to weigh in and I really want to hear your thoughts on this because it really, again, I so applaud prosecutors and police for, for taking a hard stance on this one instead of saying we're taking the easy way and saying we're not touching it because of, of religious freedom. Yeah. No, this little yeah. girl is dead and she should not be dead and there's and that's just finite. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. you, you can argue whatever full, you want, but that full, is just the fact. Yeah, full stop, yeah. Yes. So, um, God, this really upset me. A lot upsets me about this, but reportedly, Elizabeth's body was in such a horrible state that when the paramedics finally were called and they walked in there, we're told that they were sickened, Ugh. sickened by what they saw, which I think tells everyone exactly how bad her last days on this earth were. Yeah. And that's just not right. Yeah. That's just not right. Elizabeth deserved better than that. So Elizabeth's parents, Carrie and Jason Strews, 47 and 50 years old, were charged a few days later after Elizabeth's death with murder, torture, failing to supply the necessities of life, which is giving us a little ins insight there to the laws of Australia. And they have not entered pleas so far. Then prosecutors began a six-month investigation into what really happened, and they say they determined these parents didn't act alone. So on July 5th, a search warrant was issued at a Homestead Avenue property in Queensland. This was used as a place of worship by many of the members. Officers reportedly arrested seven women, five men, ranging in ages from 19 to 64. And not one of them had common sense to say, don't do this. So yeah. police allege that all 12 people arrested were aware of Elizabeth's condition, did not take any steps to provide medical assistance to the child. All 12 have been charged with murder. Police were wearing body cameras as they entered the residence when they executed this search warrant. Now here's a clip and also, so you'll know that the faces have been blurred, but I think you get a sense of like, I mean, the room is when the prosecutors walk in. Take a look. The reason why that we're here this morning is I have a warrant that's been issued under the Police Powers and Responsibilities Act to search this dwelling in relation to property, OK? The time now is 6.37 on the 5th of July, 2022. Mm -hmm. now placing on the arrest for murder. OK, am I the only one, and I'm, I'm going to repeat this for the people just listening, who is completely annoyed as these people are being arrested because you can see the suspects 
hugging and kissing each other goodbye as they are being taken into custody and taken out of the home. Like you could see one person's got like a blanket wrapped around them. Can you give me a freaking break here? Really? You're under arrest for murder and yet you have a moment to hug and kiss goodbye your fellow fringe religious mates. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, um, one thing that stood out to me when you were just talking about the charges is that they 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 charged everyone because they were aware of her medical condition. Yes. Mm -hmm. Again, that puts them on notice of some sort of duty that they had towards this young girl. And I was trying to think because another one of the charges was that they withheld necessary life support or I forget the way necessities that it was for life. Necessities, necessities. Necessities. That could be food. Right. What if you had an again, just to kind of explore this religious aspect of it. But what if you had a religion where they felt God will sustain us? We don't need to eat. And they starved a young child to death. I don't think there would be anyone arguing that that's a, a fair practice of religion. Right. And I think the prosecutors and police are equating it in the same way here. You knew her medical condition. You knew this was a necessity of life and you denied it to her as if you were starving her to death. And that's why it's no longer in this fair realm of the practice of religion, but it steps into the, the world of criminality. We're, we're going to find out how it all plays out in court. But those are some interesting things that stood out to me on this. Acting Superintendent Gary Watts said that an investigation of this magnitude was unprecedented, even so not only do are we finding this incredibly unusual, he's saying this is unusual for Australia, saying, quote, in my 40 years of policing, I've never faced a matter like this again. So they are really, really working outside the box here in the yeah. legal system to bring justice. So Elizabeth's eldest sibling, Jade, who is now 24, she has spoken publicly in the months since her sister's death. She said that she ran away from the family at age 16 after questioning her parents' religious practices. Also, Jade says, you know, that um, also for her sexual freedoms because she is a lesbian and they frowned upon that. So she left for many, many reasons. She felt that she could not be herself and had, you know, was being very restricted and didn't, you know, agree with a lot of this. So um, she's been able to fill in some details. Uh, she's spoken to news organizations and obviously to police. Elizabeth was one of eight children, two of whom are adult age, and the remaining children are ages three to 16. This is according to you know the sister. Nine News Australia TV has been investigating this case and the group. They've done a, a great job, and I want to play a clip for you to give you some background and insight, and of course, you all can find more of their videos, but I, I just, we really need to know more from the perspective of folks on the ground there. So I'm going to play this clip now. It'll give you some background. Well, Alex Heike joins me in the studio now. Alex, you got some more information on this fringe religious group. Yeah, Andrew, they've been operating for more than a decade, trying to push their ideologies onto other people and also attempting to recruit as many members as possible, known simply as the Saints. They follow Catholic teachings, but with their own twist, based in Toowoomba and turning homes into churches. Let's take a closer look at this cult-like group. They call themselves the Saints, but police say 14 they've arrested are sinners. A fringe religious group largely made up of members from three families, the Stevenses, the Strews and the Schoen Fishers. Leader of the church, Brendan Stevens, he and his wife Loretta plus six of their children have been charged with the murder of Elizabeth Strew. I find that really fascinating, Josh. I really do. That, that this is formed basically by three families, lots of members of the family, you know, yeah. And and they're worshiping in their homes. Right. It, 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 it shows how kind of insulated and close knit and cut off from the rest of the world that they were. Yeah, but they weren't living in a cave. So the, here's right. the thing. At some point, they were members of society. We don't know whether they work or, you know, they're self-sustained. You can say one thing about people who have been brought up you know, especially children who are denied access to anything and have no idea about anything. But these are adults who at some point lived in the real world. And so therefore, they have an understanding of what the norms 
expectations and laws are, even if they choose to live. And they're not really that off the grid. I mean, if you're living in a neighborhood and the neighbors can hear you, you know, chanting and singing. Well, and you know what diabetes is and you know how to treat it. Exactly. So I don't think that they can, you know, give us the, ooh, we didn't know. I I just don't think that's going to work. Elizabeth's parents have appeared before Tawamba Magistrates Court in late June, reportedly via a video link. They chose to represent themselves. I don't know. Josh, maybe they don't believe in attorneys. Whatever. They're putting everything in God's hands. Yes. Yes, they are. And and if they and if they are, maybe we finally will get true justice here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're representing themselves in the initial hearing. They remain in custody until their next hearing um, later in July. Uh, others appear to want to represent themselves. Um, there were uh, some reports in Australian uh, media saying that some of them of those charged are complaining Yes, they complained to the judge saying that they're being mistreated because they're not being permitted bail. I do see the irony here. Do you not? (laughs) Really, you're being mistreated because you've been charged with murder. An eight-year-old girl is dead, but somehow your rights you're having a problem with. Really? Right, right. Really? Oh, my goodness. So um, here's the other thing. Now we have these children, minors, Elizabeth's brothers and sisters who are minors. And so like, what's gonna happen to them? So the oldest sister, Jade, says that um, she is trying to keep some level of contact with her siblings. Her hope is that she can unite her remaining siblings with the family that she has formed and that she can then care for them. So of course, all of this is now going to be decided by a court as well. What happens to the minor children here? And what if, now here's the other thing. What happens if the parents, Elizabeth's parents, do eventually get released on bail? Do then they get to parent the rest of the children or do they have their version of child family services say, oh hell no. You would expect that the Australian version of DCFS would step in and and I can't imagine them returning the remaining children to the to the care and custody of the parents. I can't either. I can't either. But you never know. No. You never know. So we're going to follow this case. We thought it was fascinating. And um, let's let's see how it progresses and see what, if any effects it has on broadening laws here or the application of laws to protect children. That's, That's the part that I remain hopeful about. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime stories that you all are talking about on social media. Our producer, Will Updike, is here now because he loves to read all your comments, and so do I. Absolutely. It's my favorite. Uh, Hey, Anna, how's it going today, Josh? Hey. (laughs) Get to see you twice this week. It's great. Uh, (laughs) Anyways, today we have one of the most like bizarre justifications for a crime I've ever heard. So we have an Oklahoma man who allegedly killed his friend because the victim had summoned Bigfoot to come and kill him. Right off the bat, got to acknowledge tragic loss of life here. Our thoughts with the family. It's so unfortunate. But this case was kind of interesting just because this has got to be, you know, one of the most bizarre, downright disrespectful kind of justifications for a crime. So this case comes out of Pontotoc uh, County, Oklahoma, where the man was arrested after allegedly striking and fatally strangling his friend while they were fishing in a river. So on yeah, just just terrible, terrible stuff. But on Saturday, July 9th, the suspect, Larry Sanders, and the victim, Jimmy Knighton, were reportedly noodling when a confrontation turned physical and Sanders fatally attacked Knighton. If you're not familiar with new, with noodling, it's a bare hand style of fishing where like you're going along like a muddy bank and you stick your fist into where you think a catfish might be and it grabs onto your fist and you then pull it into your boat. Um, I'm so glad you explained this because noodling, I'm actually thinking you're either floating on like a noodle that you use in a pool (laughs) or I'm thinking to myself, noodling, is there a little something, something going on there? But (laughs) thank you, Montana man, for explaining this to me. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so uh, a day after Knighton's death, uh, Sunday, July 10th, the authorities ended up finding the victim's body. Now, this launched an investigation with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Uh, and, you know, they discerned that Larry Sanders had allegedly killed Jimmy Knighton on the South Canadian River the evening before. Now, how this kind of all unfurled is that Sanders reportedly admitted to one of his family members that he had, in fact, killed his friend. And that according to authorities, Sanders' motive for the killing was that Mr. Knighton had, and this is in quotes, Mr. Knighton had summoned Bigfoot to come and kill him. And that is why he had to kill Mr. Knighton. Now, the sheriff uh, in this case added that Sanders appeared to be under the influence of something. Uh, they didn't go into detail there, but I would definitely believe that. So according to the Bureau, Sanders was arrested and booked into Pon Tatuck County Jail on a charge of first degree murder. The medical examiner is going to determine the cause and manner of the victim's death. Um, this was definitely uh, one that people had a lot to say about. Uh, Jamie M said of the suspect in this case, he looks like Bigfoot's missing toe, which I'm just going to describe it for you for the audio listeners. I mean, he looks like a guy who is possibly coming off some sort of drug bender. There's no other way I can like describe uh, his mugshot other than dirty. Like the man just looks very dirty. He has, well, like, he was noodling. Sort of... I mean, yes. come on. That's not a clean thing, I think. <laughs> no, no. Definitely Except it's not. in water. So I guess it washes off all the mud. Yeah, well, it's normally kind of murky water that you're doing it in, too. So it's not it's like it's not the cleanest uh, form of fishing. Troy W. said this man will next summon the abominable snowman. Which, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, like what that's got to be up there in, you know, I, I can't think of a more bizarre thing to have summoned. Maybe Loch Ness Monster on land. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I just can't really figure what, anything else out. Andrew D said they were noodling. That should give you some clues right there. Uh, Anna, you basically had the same thought. A very bizarre activity, very bizarre way to end it. Grim said the Bigfoot defense almost sounds like a chess move. Now, there's all sorts of bizarre defenses, but Josh, have you ever heard anything as wild as a Bigfoot defense? No, and and I got to I can only imagine the cocktail of substances this person was on to uh, imagine a fictional figure has been summoned to come kill you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Volume size kind of spoke for authorities on this one. They uh, they said, "I'm not having this. Not on my squatch." Oh, well done. Uh, but wow. that is going to do it for today's comment section. I always want to let the listeners know if you want a chance to get your comment featured on this show, you can go ahead and leave those over on our YouTube community page. We're also active on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, so make sure and follow us there and leave your comments. But that is going to do it for today's comment section. Thank you both so much for having me. Thank you, Will. See you next week. All right, see ya. You know, Josh, I really do read the comments. Obviously, Will does as well. And I do know that we have a lot of international followers, fans, and a lot in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United Kingdom. I mean, England. We. I mean, it, it's wonderful. And I love um, people because... I, I just love to know that our community is so huge. And today wow. we included an international case. So I can't wait to hear everyone's comments. I really want to hear everyone's comments also on that um, love triangle that ended so tragically, because I, I just think it, these are these are cases that we can all, you know, have very strong opinions about. So I'm looking forward to reading them. Um, that's our program for this week. So Josh, where can people find you on social media, your podcast? Yeah. When does it come out? Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ and check out the True Crime Daily Sidebar podcast. I think we have the next one coming out uh, next Tuesday. Great. Excellent. Excellent. You can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Um, I cover some crime, but sometimes it's really stupid stuff. Like this week, I did a poll on Instagram asking people to vote on my new pink um, eyeglass frames. OK, the poll is still current, not by the time this podcast drops. OK, but so far we're in favor of liking the new pink frames. Good. That's right. I keep it kind of silly because the stuff that I do for my primary work is so dark and heavy. I've got to have a balance somewhere yeah. else. So you can find all our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. If you like to watch us or comment on YouTube, we've got our own channel, which Little Birdie told me we're going to be expanding, right? <laughs> we're going to, we, 
true crime all the time. So please subscribe to True Crime Daily on YouTube. Sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs> <laughs>